Hello, it's coming up to 12 o'clock. In a moment, we'll take you live to the Commons and Prime Minister's questions. Uh, but first, let's talk to our political editor, Beth Rigby, who's with me here in the studio. Um, Beth, the first PMQs after mm. the Easter break, are they all going to be a bit too fired up on too many eggs, do you think? There's going to be a lot of material, isn't there? Uh, we've got the whole um, saga around Angela Rayner, now a police investigation, so I'm sure that the Prime Minister uh, will want to raise that. And, of course, uh, we've had the publication of Liz Truss's book, uh, Labour already doing attack ads over trust in the, the economy, so they'll probably go on that. In our history. And that is why we've introduced a bill to quash convictions, delivered schemes to ensure swift compensation and established an independent inquiry. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. So Mr. Yeah. Speaker, does my right honourable friend agree towns like Barnstable, the main transport hub in North Devon, serving hundreds of square miles, should have a fully functioning bus station? As Lib Dem run North Devon Council has not reopened out since the pandemic, leaving residents out in the cold with no oh, public no. facilities. Oh, As people start to feel the difference with tax cuts and falling inflation, does he agree we should be making it easier for people to use the bus, come to town and support Barnstable's local economy? And will my right honourable friend join me in calling on the Lib? Dems to get on with reopening the bus station. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, we know how vital bus services are for communities right across the country. That's why we're providing Devon with £17 million to deliver better bus services, and we introduced the £2 fare bus cap. But I know my honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Transport, was recently visiting my uh, honourable friend, seeing the benefits of reopening Barnstable Bus Station, and it's clear that the local Liberal Democrats should just get on and do it. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Uh, can I too welcome the postmasters in the gallery in their quest for justice? And, Mr Speaker, this week we marked 35 years since the disaster at Hillsborough and the enduring courage and determination of the families must be marked by the passing of a Hillsborough law. <laughs> Mr Speaker, we also lost Lord Richard Rosser, a lifelong member of the Labour Party. He will be greatly missed, and our thoughts are with his wife Sheena, his family and friends. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I'm privileged to be the proud owner of a copy of the former Prime Minister's new book. Wow. It's a rare, unsigned copy. <laughs> it's quite the, it's the only unsigned copy. It's quite the read. She claims the Tory party's disastrous kamikaze budget that triggered chaos for millions was, her words, the happiest moment of her premiership. Wow. Has the Prime Minister met anyone with a mortgage who agrees? <laughs> Well, Mr Speaker, all I'd say is he uh, ought to spend a bit less time reading that book and a, bit, and, a bit more, and a bit more time reading the Deputy Leader's tax advice. I think we'll have less talking. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we've got a billionaire Prime Minister and a billionaire Prime Minister, both of, both of whose families have used schemes to avoid millions of pounds of tax, smearing a working class woman. And, I know, and the Prime Minister. The former Prime Minister has a long list of people to blame for the economic misery. They don't want to hear it. They made her Prime Minister. And millions of people are paying the price. She's got a long list of people to blame. She blames the Governor of the Bank of England, the Treasury, the Office for Budget Responsibility. The American President is blamed at one point. We even learned that the poor old lettuce was part of the deep state. <laughs> Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it's actually much simpler than that? It was the Tories' unfunded tax cuts, yeah. tens of billions of pounds yeah. of unfunded tax cuts, that crashed the economy yeah. and left millions paying more on their mortgages, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. 
Mr. Mr Speaker, everyone knows that two years ago I wasn't afraid to repeatedly warn about what her economic policies would lead to, even if it wasn't what people wanted to hear at the time. Mr Speaker, I was right, I was right then, but I'm also right now when I say that his economic policies would be a disaster for Britain. He would send inflation up, mortgages up and taxes up, and working people would pay the price. I appreciate the Prime Minister having the stomach to say it out loud, but everyone knows it's the Tory party's obsession with wild, unfunded tax cuts that crash the economy. We know it, he knows it, they know it, and the whole country is living it. So when is he finally going to learn the lesson from his predecessor's mistakes and explain where the money is coming from for his own completely unfunded £46 billion pound promise to scrap national insurance? Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker when, when my predecessor was running for leader, to use his words, I did have the stomach to argue out loud about her economic policies, had the conviction to say that they were wrong. But not once, but twice, he tried to make his predecessor Prime Minister. Despite him opposing NATO and Trident, ignoring anti-Semitism and siding with our enemies. It's clear what he did. He put his own interests ahead of Britain's. Uh, I think actually when he was running for Prime Minister, uh, for leader, he, he was explaining how he's funneling money from poor areas to pay it into richer areas. We know what his record is. I, I, I notice he's not denying the £46 billion pound promise to scrap the national insurance, but he's refusing to say where the money will come from. And we've been trying for months to get to the bottom of this. So now's his chance. No more spin, no more waffle, no more diversion. I know that'll be difficult. He can either, Mr Speaker, this is the choice, he can either cut state pension or the NHS that national insurance funds, that's route one, or he can put up income tax. Which one is it? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, we've just cut taxes by £900 for a typical worker. We've delivered the biggest tax cut for businesses since the 1980s. But while we're cutting taxes, Labour is already putting them up in Wales, putting up taxes right now for small businesses, in Birmingham, putting up council tax by 21%. And in London, in London, his mayor has put up taxes by 70%, Mr Speaker. And this is just a glimpse of what they'd do if they got in power. A few weeks ago, he finally admitted it to The Sun. What would he say he would do? I quote, he said, we would put up taxes. It's always the same, Mr Speaker. Higher taxes and working people paying the price. No single politician has ever put tax up more times than he has. But, but, but Mr Speaker, uh, just hang on, because he was given the chance... He was, no, he was just given the chance to rule out yeah. cutting the NHS or state pensions to pay for scrapping this... No, he's... I was a lawyer long enough to know when someone's avoiding the question. So I, I'm going to give him another chance. Will he now rule out cuts the NHS, cuts the state pension, or putting up taxes to pay for his unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance? Which is it? Mr Speaker, I make absolutely no apology about wanting to end the unfairness of the double taxation on work, Mr Speaker. The NHS is receiving record funding under this Conservative government. Pensioners have just received a £900 increase under this government. But if he wants to talk about tax, let's have a look at what Labour's brand newly appointed tax adviser has to say. This adviser, this adviser thinks that supporting pensioners is a complete disgrace, Mr Speaker. He believes their free TV licences are ridiculous. And if it wasn't bad enough, this adviser has called for increases in income tax, in national insurance and VAT. Now, it all makes sense now. That's who the Shadow Chancellor has been copying and pasting from. So, so, so this is genuinely extraordinary. Two chances, two chances, 
to rule out, Mr. Speaker, two chances to rule out cuts to state pension, yeah. cuts to the NHS, yeah. or income oh, no, tax no, no. rises to fund his promise to abolish national insurance. Order, order, order. Mr. Hull, I want you to set a good example, not a bad one. Keir Starmer. Mr. Speaker, th this really matters. He's had two chances to rule out these cuts: cuts to NHS, cuts to uh, tax or, or pensions or tax rates. This matters to millions of people watching who want to know what's going to happen to the NHS and pensions. Uh, it really does matter to millions of people who are watching. So I'll be really generous now and give him one last chance. Very simple, very clear. Is his £46 billion promise to abolish national insurance being paid for by cuts to the NHS, cuts to the state pension, or yet another Tory tax rise? Yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, he's really got to keep up, Mr Speaker. Right? It's, it's, this, it's this government that's just delivered a £900 increase to the state pension. It's this government that's already committed to the triple lock for the next parliament. He, he had six opportunities. I didn't think I heard him say that, Mr Speaker. And when it comes to the NHS, you'd much rather be treated in Conservative-run NHS in England, not the Labour-run NHS in Wales, Mr Speaker. But it's another week where all we heard is political sniping, Mr Speaker, not a word about their plans for the country. He's failed to acknowledge that since we last met, taxes have been cut by £900, state pensions have gone up, free childcare has been expanded, wages have risen for nine months in a row, Mr Speaker, and just today, inflation down again to 3.2 per cent. Our plan is working and the Conservatives are delivering a brighter future for Britain. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, you will not be surprised to learn that I am very much welcome the £20 million allocated to Carlton in my Gedling constituency yeah. as part of the long-term plan for tight towns. But I am very eager to see that this money is spent according to local wishes. I know there will be consultations following the setting up of the Towns Board, so will my right honourable friend join me in urging Colton residents to take part in those forthcoming consultations, to make sure their voices are heard and to ensure that this money is spent where the people want? Yeah. Can I thank my honourable friend for his tireless campaigning on behalf of the residents of Carlton? Our long-term plan for towns means that 75 towns across the country, including Carlton, will benefit from £20 million each to invest in their local area. But crucially, as he said, that will be in the hands of local people deciding on their priorities for the place that we live, whether it's regenerating local high streets, investing in parks and green spaces, or tackling antisocial behaviour. We're levelling up across the country, and he deserves enormous praise for his role in securing that investment. SNP leader Stephen Flint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This week, a former Prime Minister who oversaw a financial crash before being unceremoniously turfed from office told the public the truth, and I'm not referring to that one, Mr Speaker, <laughs> because on Monday, Gordon Brown told the people of these aisles that the forces pulling Britain apart are greater than the forces holding it together. So maybe the Prime Minister can find some time this afternoon to perhaps agree with just one of his predecessors. Oh. Well, Mr Speaker, where I do agree with my predecessor very strongly is that Scotland would be far stronger inside the United Kingdom. Stephen Flynn. But Mr Speaker, of course, where Gordon Brown was also correct was in stating that Scottish independence is not simply off the agenda. And indeed, those remarks were echoed just yesterday by the General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress, who stated that it remains an unresolved issue, Mr Speaker, before going on to state, and I confirm an email laugh at her, but she said, that can be a very dangerous place to end up in when you are not allowing people to express their wishes in a democratic <laughs> manner. So may I ask... So may I ask the... So may I ask the Prime Minister, does he welcome the fulsome, wholehearted and warm support of the Labour Party in denying the people of Scotland that opportunity to have a say over their own future? Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, we did have a democratic vote on that topic. Uh, but what I would suggest 
to the SNP is that rather than obsessing about independence yeah. and indeed wasting time cracking down on free speech and trying to lock yeah. up JK Rowling, he should focus on what the people of Scotland actually care about – schools, hospitals, jobs and our new tax cuts. Yeah. Name Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I abhor a two-tier policing system, and we must ensure that everyone is treated equally under the rule of law. The Labour Police and Crime Commissioner, who investigated the Beagate scandal, handed their police chief constable a new three-year contract whilst the investigation into the Labour Party leader and deputy leader was ongoing. Now, two former Labour MPs are overseeing the force due to investigate the opposition deputy leader. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that complete transparency throughout this investigation is of the utmost importance? Yeah. Yeah. My uh, right honourable friend makes an important point. A key principle of our country is that there are the same rules for everyone. And when it comes to this topic, I do think the Labour leader should show some leadership. To avoid stop reading the legal advice, simply just publish it and get a grip of the situation. And it says a lot about his priorities that when it comes to his famed legal expertise, he's more than happy to help defend his butteria but refuses to help his own deputy leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The recently published Canova report makes it absolutely clear that the IRA was riddled with British agents. Uh, from top to bottom. Those agents were involved in abduction, torture and murder of British and Irish citizens. The British government, successive British governments, knew all about it and did nothing. The report also calls for an apology from the government to those victims. Will the, will the Prime Minister take this opportunity now to make that apology? Well, Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman will know, this is an interim report, as the Secretary of State has laid out. We can't comment on the findings until we get the final report, but we would never condone wrongdoing where there is evidence of this. But I will say this also because it's not said enough. The overwhelming majority of the police, armed forces and intelligence services serve with great distinction. Yes. They defended democracy in the face of some horrendous violence, and without their service and their sacrifice, there would have been no peace process. They helped ensure that the future of Northern Ireland will never be decided by violence, but by the consent of its people. Yeah. Yeah. So Simon yeah. Clark. Yeah. 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 Does my uh, right honourable friend agree with me? Uh, we don't agree on everything, but we do, do agree on this, that if anyone <laughs> wants to see why this government has introduced strong mayors, they need only look to Ben Houchen yeah. in the Tees Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Saving our airport to introducing our free port to bringing steel making back, Ben delivers. And does my right honourable friend agree with me that the best thing that Ben has done is do this without charging any mayoral tax, which his Labour opponent would need to do to fund his unfunded spending plans? Well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right to raise the great work of Ben Houchen, and I share his concerns about the pledges of the Labour candidate. Over £130 million of unfunded spending, showing that Labour can't be trusted. And we all see the results of this, Mr Speaker, in Labour-run Birmingham. Taxes going up by 20 per cent. And that is the story of what Labour in local government means. Working people paying the price, and it's exactly why he and I completely agree on this. The people of Teesside should vote Ben Houchen and vote Conservative. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Last year in Shropshire, 10,000 people waited for more than 24 hours in A&E. That's 10,000 people over 65 waiting on hard plastic chairs or in trolleys in our accident and emergency department. The Prime Minister tells us he's got a plan for the NHS, but what people in North Shropshire want to know is how long they are going to have to wait for him to get on and fix the issues where we are. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, with the record funding that we're putting into the NHS, our urgent emergency care plan is delivering more ambulances, more beds, but also faster discharge through our hospitals to speed the flow. And that plan is working. Of course, there's more to do. But this winter, we saw ambulance and A&E waiting times improve from the year before uh, for the first time in many years. And if we stick to the plan, we'll continue to deliver improvement for her constituents and everyone else. Gareth Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 2010, somebody earning £15,000 a year paid £1,700 in income tax. Today, somebody earning £15,000 a year pays less than £500 of tax. So, does the Prime Minister agree with me that this has helped create jobs, 
growth and self-reliance. Yeah. My honourable friend is quite right, and because of our plan, the economy, after a tough few years, has indeed turned the corner. Inflation has fallen from over 11 per cent to 3.2 per cent. It's forecast a return back to target in just a few months, a year ahead of expectations. And that's why, Mr Speaker, we've been able to cut people's taxes, a tax cut, as he mentioned, worth £900 for an average worker, which, by the way, is part of our plan to end the long-term unfairness of the double taxation on work. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Four years ago, my constituent Juliana was drugged and raped by her then-boyfriend. After his conviction, Juliana was advised that reading a transcript of his trial would help her to come to terms with her experience. But when she requested that transcript, she was told that she would have to pay more than £7,000. Astonishingly, Juliana is not alone. I have heard about victims who have been quoted fees of up to £22,000 just to read trial transcripts that are part of their own story. Mr Speaker, justice should not have a price tag. The Liberal Democrats' amendment to the Victims' Bill would give all victims the right to read sentencing remarks marks and summings up free of charge. Mm -hmm. Juliana is here in the gallery today and she asks if the Prime Minister will support that amendment. Will he look her in the eye and say yes? Mr Speaker, I'm extremely sorry to hear about Juliana's case and my sympathies with her and indeed her family. We are committed to improving victims' access to court transcripts to help them move on and rebuild their lives. We already offer a free service to families of homicide victims, uh, for example, and that's why we have already committed to a one-year pilot to help identify the current demand, inform our next steps, and alongside this, we're actively looking at other options to immediately reduce the costs. Jim Sunderland. Mr Speaker, Bracknell Forest Council has a particular challenge with special educational needs and I am keen to support them. I am grateful to the Government for the recent SEND review, the significant increase in resources and the bespoke safety valve programme for Bracknell, but additional school places are needed now. Could the Prime Minister please agree today to release the funding for our new SEND units at Sandhurst and Edgebarrow schools and commit to fully funding up front our new SEN school in Crowthorn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I thank my honourable friend for highlighting how Bracknell Forest local authority has worked positively with the department through the safety valve programme. And as part of that agreement, over the next few years, the council will receive £16 million in extra funding to provide the vital education that my honourable friend's constituents deserve. Uh, I'm told that the department is still reviewing capital bids for the safety valve programme, but they will be in touch with local authorities directly as soon as possible. Daniel Zeichner. In the exchanges earlier, we didn't hear much of a defence from the Prime Minister of his predecessor, so perhaps he could tell the House, what does he consider to be her greatest achievement? <laughs> well, this, Mr Speaker, what I want... Uh, Mr Speaker, while the party opposite were busy trying to take us back into the EU and reverse the referendum result, my predecessor was signing trade deals around the world, which have now meant, which have now meant Mr Speaker, that Brexit Britain has overtaken the Netherlands, France and Japan to become the fourth largest exporter in the world. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent, Claire Massey, and one of her two children almost lost their lives in a fire at her home in February 2023. Since then, Claire has been a victim of bullying by aggressive claims handlers and negligent and unprofessional conduct, including violating a policy and withdrawing alternative accommodation by the insurer, policy expert, part of the accredited Insurance Europe Group and Limited uh, Trinity Claims Management. Claire has raised institutional failings with the Financial Conduct Authority, which appears toothless. She's also successfully raised individual issues with the Financial Ombudsman, but the delaying tactics of the insurance means she's no closer to a resolution. Claire is here in the gallery today and is asking, will the Prime Minister meet with her and me to look at how we can better protect consumers against bad practices in the insurance industry? And does he agree with me that it is time to establish an office of the whistleblower? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My uh, honourable friend is an excellent campaigner on behalf of her constituent, and can I extend my sympathies to Claire and her family? Uh, whilst 
it, I can't comment on individual cases, I'm sure she'll understand. I know that the Financial Conduct Authority does have the powers that it needs to take action against firms that breach its rules, and further customers can contact the Financial Ombudsman Service, whose decisions are binding on insurers. But I will immediately ensure that the relevant minister meets with my honourable friend to look more closely at the specific issue and the case that she raises. Hey. Ukrainian Member of Parliament uh, Mikola Stefanchuk is in the public gallery this afternoon. I'm sure we all wish to welcome him and wish uh, Ukraine, Slavy Ukraine. Mikola has told me that Ukraine has the people, Ukraine has the courage, but U Ukraine does not currently have the weapons and the air defence to secure her freedom. In light of today's Russian attack on Chernihiv this morning, which has killed at least 10 and injured many more. Can I ask the Prime Minister, will he respond to President Zelensky's statement that this would not have happened if Ukraine had, had received so sufficient uh, defense, uh, air defence equipment? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, it was a pleasure to address members of the Ukrainian Parliament when I visited Ukraine earlier this year. Indeed, it was my first foreign visit of the year. I was the first foreign leader to visit Ukraine and President Zelensky to demonstrate our strong support for the Ukrainian people at their moment of struggle against Russian aggression. Uh, we've increased the amount of support that we've given to Ukraine this year, indeed the first major country to do so, uh, and a big part of that support concerns air defence, where we have led in supporting Ukraine's efforts, will continue to do so, and also continue to encourage other countries around the world to step up and match our leadership, because we all want to see a future for Ukraine based on freedom from tyranny. Nikki Aitken. Mr Speaker, on a recent visit to Pimlico in my constituency, the Prime Minister heard directly from local people concerned about the eye-watering rise in violent crime and robberies. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the London Labour Mayor has failed to take yeah, advantage yeah. of extra government funding to recruit more police and that on the 2nd of May, Londoners can send him a very clear message, he's let them down? Yeah. Mr Speaker, Sadiq Khan is failing London. While burglary is down across England, it's up in London. Violent crime down across England, but up in London. And the Labour Mayor is the only one of 43 police and crime commissioners to have missed his police recruitment target. <laughs> Londoners will have a chance, Mr Speaker, to cast their vote on the 2nd of May, and I hope that they kick him out, because we all know they'll be safer with Susan Hall. is reeling from the discovery of 35 bodies and unidentifiable cremated ashes at a local funeral home. Their pain has been made worse when they realise the funeral plans they'd used their life savings for were fake. Does the Prime Minister agree that in these unique and limited circumstances, banks should offer discretion when deciding if chargeback applies to payment refunds? Yeah. Oh, can I express my sympathies to the families affected by the case that the Honourable Lady raises? Uh, I believe that Ministry of Justice are urgently looking at the matter that she's raised. I'll ensure that someone gets in touch with her as soon as possible. Derek Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Ro robotic surgery allows laparoscopic surgery to be performed with increased precision, flexibility and control. This can result in reduced patient complication rates, reduced length of stay in hospital and reduced hospital readmissions. However, there is currently no robotic surgery provision in Cornwall. As a result, residents of Cornwall have to travel to Devon for robotic procedures, a journey of more than 80 miles, 120 miles if you're from El Silly, for West Cornwall and El Silly residents. Will my friend the PM, the Prime Minister, commit to ring fence capital funding for Cornwall to establish a robotic surgery service and address the health inequalities our constituents have lived with for far too long? Yeah. Uh, can I thank my honourable friend for highlighting the potential of this innovative technology uh, for patient care. I'm delighted to see that more generally Cornwall is benefiting from our new hospital programme, providing a new women's and children's hospital in the centre of Royal Cornwall, uh, which he and I discussed when I was last with him. Uh, but I can also tell him that NHS England are actively exploring opportunities to expand robotic assisted surgery. Any uh, decisions on funding new allocations will factor in health inequalities, such as areas with less access to robots today. And I will ensure that the current access to robotic surgery in my honourable friend's local community is appropriately considered by the relevant health minister. George Galloway. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister told us on Monday that he was off to make a telephone call 
to Mr. Netanyahu to urge restraint on a government that has killed and maimed well over 100,000 people in six months, 72% of them women and children. Can you tell us how the telephone call went and what he will do if his advice is not taken and an unrestrained war begins? Mr Speaker, I was pleased to speak with Prime Minister Netanyahu, who thanked the UK for their support of Israel's security over the weekend. We also discussed the situation and how Iran is isolated on the world stage. Uh, and also, I made the point to him that significant escalation is not in anyone's interest, and it's a time for calm heads to prevail. I also reiterated our concerns about the humanitarian situation in Gaza, where I welcome the statements and commitments that the Israeli government have made about significantly increasing aid into Gaza. And now we need to see those commitments delivered. Nigel Bills. Thank you. The residents in Smalley and Denby are now faced by two huge solar farm applications with only a 500 metre gap between them. And the, uh, both sites are wholly in the green belt. So would the Prime Minister agree we should change planning guidance to make it absolutely clear that productive farms in the green belt are not the right place for solar farms and the investment and the time being spent should go on sites that might be appropriate like car parks or brownfield land or roofs of industrial buildings rather than wasting people's time and causing fear like this? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is right that particularly at a time of increased geopolitical risk, we must protect our nation's food security and therefore our most valuable agricultural land. We do want to see more solar, which is one of the cheapest forms of energy, but, as he said, on brownfield sites, rooftops and away from our best agricultural land. And that's why our recently published National Infrastructure Planning Rules set out the requirement for solar not to be placed on what is described as best and most valuable versatile land where possible. Uh, the Energy and Environment Secretaries are ensuring that developers and planning authorities strike the right balance so that we can deliver what he wants, which is more British food grown here, here at home. That's from McKinnell. Yeah. Yeah. Out recently with Chris McEwen, the mayoral candidate in Teesside, yeah. it was clear that residents are really worried about crime. Yeah. Levels in Tory-run Teesside are some of the highest in the country. Yeah. Yeah. Residential burglary rate is 52% higher than anywhere else in the country. When will the Prime Minister realise that he's not only lost control of his party, but of crime in this country too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. I mean, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what a joke, right? We've got 50, we've got Police and Crime Commissioner elections across the country, and the Honourable Lady really should look at the record. Under this government, crime has been cut by 50%. 20,000 more police officers. But here are the facts, and this is why it's so extraordinary to hear what she said. People with a Labour police and crime commissioner are more likely to be victims of burglary and twice as likely to be victims of robbery. The facts completely speak for themselves. Vote Conservatives for safer streets. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every month, my constituents see the Labour on Warrington Council spend nearly four and a half million pounds on interest payments to cover their £1.8 billion pound debt. Oh, sure. Borrowing they've used to spend on an energy company that went bust, offices in Birmingham and Manchester, and even a business park that they purchased through an offshore company, presumably to avoid paying tax. Oh. <laughs> does, the Prime Minister, does the Prime Minister agree with me? It's time to send in the inspectors Warrington yeah, yeah. Council has gone too far in its money-making schemes, yeah, yeah. and local councils should focus on delivering great services, and the way to achieve that is vote Conservative yeah, on the yeah. 2nd of November. Well, Mr Speaker, this year the Government announced a further £600 million in extra funding for local councils, a real terms increase as it has done every single year of this Parliament. But we all know what happens when Labour are in charge, whether it is racking up debt in Warrington, as my honourable friend said, the 21% council tax increase in Labour run Birmingham, or indeed slashing services in Nottingham, or as I just said, higher crime on average in each Labour Police and Crime Commissioner area. It's crystal clear, Mr Speaker, that whenever Labour are in charge, it's working people that pay the price. Thank you.
Mr Speaker, while 64,000 people are on the waiting list for a council house in the West Midlands, families are living in hotels, in cold and damp homes and mouldy flats. The Mayor of the West Midlands, Andy Street, has built 46 social homes in eight years. Does the Prime Minister think that is good enough? Yes. Yes. Mr. Mr Speaker, Andy Street is absolutely delivering for the West Midlands. Yes. He, unlike the Labour Mayor in London, he's delivered on all his housing targets, yeah, in fact. Yeah, but he's, it's the Labour-run council in Birmingham that's imposing on her constituents and others a 21% council tax rise. And what are they getting in exchange for that? 600 job losses, cuts to services, and on some streets, they're even turning off the lights, yeah. Mr Speaker. I tell you, what, the Labour, what Labour have done to Birmingham, the Conservatives will never let them do to Britain. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, can I just ask the Prime Minister to thank his right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Transport, for further meetings with Hitachi this morning, indeed with the union representatives. We're all glad to see what's happened with Alstom yesterday, yeah. but it's important that we do the same to support the factories up at Hitachi in Aircliff. Yeah. 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 Well, Mr. Speaker, can I thank my honourable friend for his role uh, in championing the rail industry in the UK? As uh, has he rightly said, the Department for Transport and the Secretary of State have been actively engaged with companies to ensure we have a robust supply chain. And as he knows, we're investing record amounts in rail investment, particularly uh, in the north. And we're pleased to see that that's being delivered. Question, Nasha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we're just going to dip uh, away from Prime Minister's questions. Uh, it's gone a little bit over uh, to just see what we think of it with our political editor, Beth Rigby, and also our panel of MPs. Joining us in the studio here, we've got Chris Bryant, Labour MP for Rhonda, James Daly for the Conservatives, uh, Bury North, and Alan Smith, SNP for Stirling. Um, Beth, you first of all, quite a punch exchange between the Leader of the Opposition and the Prime Minister. Yeah, I would say that that was a Prime Minister, actually, who, having faced ceaseless criticism and been on the back foot for weeks and weeks, if not months, actually seemed today to have a spring in his step. Very punchy exchanges. I think he was held by the fact he was willing, not once but twice, to actually call Liz Truss out. Now, he tends to try and avoid this, perhaps not wanting to stoke divisions in his party, uh, and Keir Starmer perhaps was anticipating that, but he didn't do it. Mm. He said, I said she was wrong. Keir Starmer came back again and he said, I said she was wrong and I wasn't afraid to call it out and then twisted it to try and attack uh, Starmer on economy and on Angela Rayner. So, and I think from the PM's team, certainly, I think they have a sense that he is on good form there. He's got the Rwanda uh, bill potentially going through today. He got his smoking ban through, yes, with a big rebellion. Uh, and he seemed quite, uh, yeah, quite chipper. I mean, the big thing on the horizon for him, obviously, is the May local elections. So let's see how long it lasts. But for a long time, he has looked really embattled. He clearly is still embattled. But he had a bit of material there by being prepared to go in on trust and also use the Angela Rayner uh, controversy uh, to try to attack Starmer. Okay. Uh, 